All right, so hi everybody, welcome back. Today we're gonna to be starting a new chapter. That's chapter 13 of Giancoli. And the topic here is fluid mechanics. So let's get into this. We're gonna start with an introduction to static fluids. So when I refer to a static fluid, I'm just talking about a fluid that is not in motion. It's not flowing in any particular way. It's just standing still. And so that immediately leads us to the question, what is a fluid in the first place? How can we define this term fluid in physics terms? Okay, so we'll start by considering three different types of forces that can be applied to an object. So let's say this is our object. It has a rectangular shape. And one way we can apply a force to the object is to compress it. If we apply a compressive force to the object, what we're doing is we're pushing inwards on it, and the force we're applying is perpendicular to the surface that we're applying the force to. So notice that this is the surface, and this is our force vector. They're perpendicular to one another, and the force vector is going inwards. That's what a compressive force is. Uh, we can also have a tensile force, which is similar to a compressive force, except we're pulling outwards, but the force is still perpendicular to the surface. Now, the other type of force we can consider is something called a shearing force. Now, in this case, we're actually applying a force parallel to the outer surface of the object, okay? So this force vector is parallel to the outer surface, and so is this one, and that's what we refer to as a shearing force. Now, what does this have to do with fluids? Well, a defining property of fluids is that they cannot resist shearing forces, okay? If you have a fluid, let's say water, and you apply a shearing force to it like this, then the fluid is just going to start flowing. They easily flow under the action of a, of a shearing force. Now, if you think about it, both liquids and gases have this property where if you apply a shearing force, it will start moving. So we consider both liquids and gases to be fluids by this definition. Of course, something that's solid would not be considered a fluid because if you apply a shearing force to it, it will move very little and it certainly won't start flowing. So that's the definition of a fluid for our purposes. Now let's get into some of the physical characteristics of a fluid. So the first one would be density. So density is simply the mass per unit volume of a fluid. What you should be picturing here is, let's say we have a container full of a fluid. It can be air, it can be water, or any number of things. But if we pick out a little volume element of the fluid, this would be a volume delta V. Well, there will be a certain amount of mass contained within that volume. That's our delta M. So the density is simply delta M over delta V. And we use the Greek letter rho to denote density. So just keep in mind, this is the letter rho in the Greek alphabet. That's what we use for density. So here's a list of some common densities uh, that we see for fluids. Um, so air at sea level has a density of 1.29 kilograms per cubic meter. By the way, that's the SI unit of density because mass is measured in kilograms and volume is measured in cubic meters in the SI system. Another common unit would be a gram per cubic centimeter, in which case this would be 0 0.00129 grams per cubic centimeter. Okay, so it turns out uh, there's a factor of a thousand difference between these two units uh, of density. Liquid water, if it's pure and doesn't have any uh, mineral content in it, will have a density of exactly 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, which is equivalent to one gram per cubic centimeter. Something like vegetable oil has a slightly lower density, about 910 kilograms per cubic meter or 0.910 grams per cubic centimeter. And then a very dense fluid, uh, an example of a very dense fluid would be mercury, which has a density of 13,600 kilograms per cubic meter or 13.6 grams per cubic centimeter. And real quick, let me show you how to do the unit conversion for density from kilograms per cubic meter to grams per cubic centimeter, just so we all are on the same page. 
Remember, one kilogram is equivalent to a thousand grams. That's the prefix kilo, it just means a thousand. One meter is equivalent to a hundred centimeters also. So let's take the example of air, which is 1.29 kilograms per cubic meter in terms of its density, uh, at, at least at room temperature. And let's convert the units. So one kilogram per 1,000 grams, that's our first conversion factor. It gets rid of kilograms, takes us to units of grams. Now we need to convert the distance unit from meters to centimeters. So of course, in every one meter, which I want to be on top to cancel with meters on the bottom, um, we have 100 centimeters, but that's not actually enough. I need to cube the whole conversion factor, okay? So let's see what happens when we do that. We have 1.29 and then meters cubed are on the bottom and then we have 1,000 grams multiplying that. And then if I have one meter and cube that whole thing, well, one cubed is still one, but now my units are meters cubed. And then I have 100 cubed times centimeters cubed, okay? So that's where we get meters cubed to cancel out. So we have to actually take the conversion factor to the third power to make this actually work. So I have 1.29 times a thousand, which by the way, a thousand is just 10 to the three, okay? Divided by a hundred to the third power, which is the same as 10 to the six. And then check out the units. We have grams on top and we have centimeters cubed on the bottom. Okay, so this is 1.29. 10 to the three over 10 to the six is just 10 to the minus three grams per cubic centimeter or in decimal form, 0 0.00129 grams per cubic centimeter. Okay, so that's how we do that unit conversion. Okay, so the next feature of a fluid that I wanna outline for you guys is something called compressibility, okay? So here's the picture you should have in your mind when it comes to compressibility. Let's say we have a cylinder and it's filled with some type of fluid and on top, we have a piston. Now, this piston can move up or down. Uh, it's free to move, but it completely encloses the fluid. So the fluid is not able to escape out because the piston holds that fluid in the cylinder. So one thing we can do is push down on that piston, okay? And in doing so, we're applying a compressive force to the fluid because we're pushing inwards on the fluid. Now, depending on what type of fluid you have in there, different things will happen. Let's say we have water inside of the cylinder. Well, if I push down on the piston, basically nothing's gonna happen. No matter how hard I push, I'm not really gonna be able to move the piston down and the volume of the water inside is not really gonna change. So what we say is that is an example of an incompressible fluid, okay? An incompressible fluid is a fluid where the volume doesn't change even when we apply compressive forces to it. So think about that for a second. If the volume is not changing, and of course the mass won't change either, it's just the same amount of mass you had before, this means the density is not changing, okay? So if you have an incompressible fluid, density doesn't change, density is constant. Now, on the other hand, if I had something like air inside of the cylinder, and I came along and I pushed down on the piston like this, it would be pretty easy to move the piston down and actually decrease the volume of the air, right? You could pretty easily do that. So that would be an example of a compressible fluid because when we apply a compressive force, we actually do change the volume. So that would be an example of a compressible fluid. So generally speaking, liquids can be treated as incompressible because volume changes are gonna be negligible, uh, even if we have very, very large forces applied to a liquid. On the other hand, any type of gas can be treated as compressible because it's very easy to change the volume if you just apply a force to it, okay? So liquids, incompressible, gases, compressible, okay? 
And of course, if you have a compressible fluid, that means the density is not constant because you can change the volume. Okay, so the next thing to define as it applies to fluids is something called pressure. So pressure is defined as the compressive force per unit area. So we have to imagine that we're applying this to some type of object and this is the surface of the object. When we say we're applying a compressive force, it means we're pushing in towards that surface and the force vector is perpendicular to that surface, okay? So you have a surface, its area is A, and you're applying a force to it, that's what we'll call F. Pressure is just the ratio of force to area. Pressure, P, is F divided by A, okay? That's the definition of pressure. So in the SI system, we have Newtons as our unit of force, and meters squared is our unit of area. So that defines the SI unit of pressure, a Newton per meter squared. And this has a special name, it's called a Pascal. So one Pascal or one PA is one Newton per square meter. Another common unit that we'll see for pressure is an atmosphere. So an atmosphere is just the average air pressure at sea level. So this would be the pressure we're experiencing right now, just sitting in a room close to sea level. And one atmosphere is defined uh, as that. And one atmosphere is equal to 1.013 times 10 to the five Pascals. So that's how you convert from Pascals, which is the SI unit, to atmospheres. Okay, so right now we're all experiencing about one atmosphere of pressure or about 1.01 .01 times 10 to the five Pascals due to the air around us. Okay, so with that definition of pressure, let's do an example problem. Consider an average person sitting on a chair with four legs. So the chair has four legs, not the person. Estimate the pressure on each leg of the chair in contact with the ground and we're gonna get this in units of Pascals and atmospheres, okay? So let's work it out. Okay, so we'll start with this. Let's let W be the total weight of the person and the chair. And if we assume that weight is evenly distributed among the four legs of the chair, then each leg of the chair is gonna press down on the ground with a force that's equal to a quarter of the weight. So let's call that force F. The force of each leg is equal to W over four. Okay, assuming the weight is evenly distributed. So we have to make some estimates, okay? Let's estimate that the total mass of the person plus the chair is something reasonable, let's say 100 kilograms. Okay? Of course, this will vary depending on the person in the chair, but 100 kilograms is a reasonable estimate. And what is the shape of the chair leg? Well, it depends, but it might be something with a square cross section like this, where this is the area A we're referring to, and this is a certain length L on each side. So if we assume a square cross section for the chair legs, then the area would just be L squared because it has length L on both sides. And let's estimate the length. So in a typical chair, that length might be about one inch or maybe two centimeters. Let's go with two centimeters. Okay. And again, that will depend on the chair, but that's a reasonable estimate. So the area therefore would be two centimeters squared, that's L squared, or 0 0.02 meters squared, 
which would be 0 0.0004 square meters. So that's the area we're dealing with. So the pressure would be the force divided by the area. And actually, uh, over here, let's work out that force real quick. The force from each leg of the chair is W over 4 or Mg over 4. So that would be 100 kilograms. G is about 10 meters per second squared. And then we're dividing by 4. So that would be 100 times 10 or about 1,000 kilograms times meters per second squared is a newton divided by four, about 250 newtons. So each leg is, is pushing down on the ground with about 250 newtons of force. So when it comes time to compute the pressure, that pressure is the force that each leg pushes down on the ground with divided by the area of each leg. So we'll say this is F leg divided by a leg. So each leg pushes down with 250 newtons of force. So that's F. And then the area, as we found a second ago, was 0 0.0004 meters squared. Okay. So it's a lot of force exerted over a pretty small area. So this is a very large pressure. This actually comes out to 6.25 times 10 to the fifth power newtons per square meter, which is 6.25, 10 to the five pascals. Because again, these are the same unit. Now, if we convert that to atmospheres, we have 6.25, 10 to the five pascals. In every one atmosphere, there are 1.013, 10 to the five, Pascals. So this works out to 6.17 atmospheres of pressure. Okay. So this is the answer in Pascals, and this is the answer in atmospheres. Okay. So next, we're going to take a look at how pressure manifests itself in a fluid. So we'll consider a container full of fluid. Let's say this is water. And the fluid is perfectly static, meaning it's not moving, it's not flowing, it's just standing perfectly still. So in this situation, the first thing to note is that the fluid will be exerting an outward pressure on the walls of the container. So at each point along the walls of the container, we'll see that the fluid is pushing outwards so in a direction that's perpendicular to the walls of the container, in other words. So we'll indicate those outward forces from the fluid onto the walls of the container using these black arrows. So there's this outward push from the fluid onto the walls of the container at every single point uh, as shown here. Now the next thing to consider is what does the pressure look like inside of the fluid? Well. To understand that, we're going to look at a tiny object with negligible mass immersed in the fluid. Okay, So imagine that this is a tiny object whose mass is so small that we can basically just ignore it. So the fluid is going to be exerting a compressive force on that object from all sides. So those compressive forces acting on the object are going to be shown with these red arrows. Okay, But here's the thing. The fluid is perfectly static. There's no flow. It's not moving in any particular direction, which means the forces that are acting on this object all have to add up to zero. Well, the only way for that to happen is if the pressure is the same in every direction, okay? So it's feeling the same amount of pressure from every single direction within the fluid. So the point is, within a fluid, the pressure doesn't depend on the direction. It's the same in all directions. Okay, so with that said, let's do an example. Suppose that during a severe storm, the pressure outside drops to 0.95 atmospheres, while the pressure inside remains one atmosphere. Consider a window in an office building made of 
a 4.5 by 1.7 meter sheet of glass. What is the total force acting on the glass from the air on either side in units of Newtons? So try to work this out using the definition of pressure shown here. And you're also going to need to know the conversion between atmospheres and pascals shown here. So pause the video, try to work it out, and then we'll go through it together. Okay, so we'll start with the picture. This is the sheet of glass in question. And this will be the inside. And this will be the outside. Okay? So the air inside the building is going to be pushing perpendicular to this glass sheet with a force that we'll call F in. But of course, the air outside will be pushing in the other direction with a force that we'll call F out. So the first thing to take a note of is that pressure is force over area. So we can rearrange that equation to say force is equal to pressure times area. So the total force that's being felt from the air on either side of this window would just be F in minus F out. The negative sign just indicates these two forces will be pushing in opposite directions, okay? Now, on a normal day where the pressure is the same inside and outside, that will just uh, give you zero for the total force, right? But in this case, we have a different pressure inside and outside, so we do have some sort of net force acting on the window. So the inside force is the pressure of the air inside times the area, and the force from the air outside would be the pressure of the air outside times the area. So we can write this as just P in minus P out times the area. Okay, so what's P in? That's um, exactly one atmosphere, 1 1.00. P out, that's 0.95 atmospheres. And what we want to do next is a unit conversion, okay? In every one atmosphere, we have 1.013 times 10 to the 5 pascals, which is the same as a newton per square meter. So we'll cancel out atmospheres, and now we have newtons per square meter. Well, what about the area? That's just going to be length times width, so 4.5 meters times 1.7 meters. So notice unit wise, we have Newtons per square meter for the pressures. But then when we multiply by the area, we have meters squared and we just get Newtons, okay? So if you make this calculation, it's gonna end up being um, 38,747 Newtons. But we'll keep two sig figs on that and round it to a nice 39,000 newtons. So that's a pretty good amount of force um, from the air. So there must be some force holding the window in place. Otherwise, the window is just going to get blown out. That's what happens. Okay, so next, we need to make a distinction between gauge pressure and absolute pressure. So you can think of these as two different scales that are commonly used to measure pressure. And here's the difference. Absolute pressure is the pressure in a fluid relative to a vacuum, okay? So relative to a completely empty region of space. So a completely empty region of space would have zero absolute pressure. And then as soon as you fill that region of space with some kind of fluid, then you have a positive absolute pressure above that. So the vacuum having zero absolute pressure is the absolute smallest amount of pressure that you can have. Now gauge pressure is not measured relative to the vacuum. Gauge pressure is measured relative to atmospheric pressure. So in other words, if we're at atmospheric pressure, we would say that you have zero gauge pressure, okay? And as soon as you go above atmospheric pressure, you have a positive gauge pressure. If you're below atmospheric pressure, you have a negative gauge pressure. That's how this works. 
So this is a nice visualization to help you understand the difference, okay? So the very smallest pressure you can have is that of a vacuum. If we measure relative to that, it's absolute pressure. Now, of course, there's a standard atmospheric pressure shown here. Anything above that is your gauge pressure. Okay, so gauge pressure is measured relative to atmospheric pressure. So how do we convert between the two? Well, it's pretty simple. The gauge pressure, P gauge, is the absolute pressure, P absolute, minus atmospheric, minus P atmospheric, okay? So that's how this works. So let's take another look at an example dealing with fluid pressure. So this is something that you've probably done before. And I know that when I was a kid and I would be at a restaurant waiting for my food to come, I would always mess around with the straw and the water. And one thing you can do is hold up a column of water in a straw um, by creating a little seal at the top with your finger. So here's what's going on in this problem. We have a cylindrical straw filled with a column of water. The air just above the water is at absolute pressure 0 0.990 atmospheres. So that's the pressure up here. And the air just below is at an absolute pressure of 1.000 atmospheres. Now, because this pressure difference exists between the air on top of and below the water, the water doesn't fall out of the straw. It's holding it in place. So the question is, based on that pressure difference, what can we say about the height of the column? In other words, what is this distance D in units of centimeters? What's the height of the column of water in the straw? So let's work it out. Okay, so let's start by making a sketch. So let's draw the uh, column of water. It's cylindrical in its shape. Like this. And again, D represents the uh, height of that column. Let's indicate some of the forces that would be acting on this column of water. Well, first, we'll have air on top, which is pushing down on it with a force that we'll call F top. And then there's air below the column of water pushing up on it with a force that we'll call F bottom. But then in addition to that, at the center of mass, we'll have the force of gravity acting, pulling it downwards. Okay, so this is our free body diagram. Now, if we apply F equals MA in the Y direction to this column, so the net force in the Y direction equals the mass times the acceleration, well, here's what we'll get. One force that's going upwards is F bottom. That's the air from below pushing up on the column. And then we have two forces going down, which carry negative signs. That would be F top and the force of gravity. Okay, so this is how the three forces add together. And they have to equal zero because there's no motion. So there's no acceleration. Okay, so next, let's remember that pressure is defined as force over area, meaning the force from a fluid can be written as the pressure times the area. Okay? So F bottom can be thought of as the pressure of the air from the bottom times the area. And then F top can be written as the pressure of the air on top times the area. The force of gravity is just M times G where M is the mass of this water and all of that is equal to zero. Okay. So let's keep going with that. Let's start by adding mg to both sides. So now we have mg equals p bottom minus p top times a. Okay, so the mass therefore would be p bottom minus p top times A divided by G. So if we were to solve for the mass of the water, that's what we would have. Okay, so next, um, let's bring in the idea of density. Remember, density is mass per unit volume. 
or symbolically rho is equal to m over v. Well, that means the mass would be the density times the volume, right? So notice how we have these two different expressions for the mass, okay? Well, we're talking about the same mass here, so why don't we set these equal? So on one hand, we have rho times v, and on the other hand, we have p bottom minus p top, and I'm just going to call that delta p times a divided by g. So the pressure difference times a divided by g. Okay, so the next thing to note is that the volume of the cylinder that we're talking about here can be thought of as the area of the cylinder, in particular the circular area, times the height. In other words, we can write this as A times D, where A is the circular area of that cross section, okay? So now my equation becomes rho times V, which I replace with A times D, that equals delta P times A divided by G. So the nice thing is the area, the cross-sectional area of our straw drops out. And now we can solve for D. D is equal to delta P divided by rho times G. Okay. All right, so let's work this out. Delta P is going to be 1.000 minus 0 0.990. That's the difference in pressure between the top and bottom given in atmospheres. But if we want to convert that to Pascals, we'd have to multiply by 1.013, 10 to the 5 Pascals. And then we divide that by rho times g. Okay, we're talking about water here. So the density is 1.00, 10 to the 3, or 1,000, kilograms per cubic meter, and G is 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay? So when we do the calculation, this comes out to 0 0.103, and then another 3 meters, which we can then round to 10.3 centimeters. Okay, so 10.3 centimeters would be the height of this column of water in the straw. So before we move on, um, let's just take a look at the units real quick because it might not be obvious how I went from this crazy set of units to meters in the next step. So let's take a look at how that worked. So we have pascals on top, and then we have kilograms per cubic meter, and then meters per second squared on the bottom. But remember that a pascal is a newton per square meter. And if we kind of consolidate what we have on the bottom there, that's kilograms, meters squared on the bottom, and seconds squared also on the bottom. So notice how meters squared cancel here and here. Okay, so we have newtons. This factor of seconds squared can go to the top because we're dividing it out twice. And then we have kilograms on the bottom. A newton is a kilogram times a meter per second squared. So multiply by seconds squared, divide by kilograms. Kilograms cancel, seconds squared cancel, and we're left with just meters. Okay, so that's how the units work out. But here is a good rule of thumb. Before calculating anything, convert everything to SI. So that is kilograms, meters, and seconds, those units. Convert everything to SI. And then the answer will come out in SI. OK? So if you plug the numbers in with SI units, the answer will come out with SI units. 
Okay, so now that we've outlined some of the basic quantities that characterize a fluid, now let's move on to how pressure in a static fluid changes with height. Okay, so we're gonna derive a result now, and in order to do that, this will be our basic setup. So we have a static fluid, and we're gonna consider a tiny element of fluid, shown here. The area is A, and the thickness is dy. So the shape of this little fluid element is a disc with a tiny little thickness dy, okay? So if we consider the different forces that are acting on this fluid element, well, of course we have the force of gravity pulling it down, but there's also a force from above the fluid pushing down on it, and then the fluid below is gonna be pushing up on that fluid element. So we have the weight or the force of gravity going down. We have the force from the bottom pushing up on the fluid element. And then we have the force from the top pushing down on it. So those are the three forces acting on our fluid element. So what we're gonna do is apply Newton's second law to the fluid element. The net force is equal to mass times acceleration. So here's what we have. We have the force from the bottom going up, so that carries a positive sign. And then we have these two forces going down, so we have minus F top minus W, and that equals zero, okay? So the, the total force is zero because we have no acceleration. This is a static fluid. Okay, so let's rearrange this. Um, how about we put F top and F bottom on the other side of the equation? So we'll add F top to both sides, and we'll subtract F bottom from both sides. And this is what we'll have. F top minus F bottom is equal to minus W or minus M times G because that's the formula for the weight. Okay, so we'll make a few substitutions. Pressure is force over area. So force can be written as pressure times area for the force from the fluid. And also density rho is equal to mass over volume which means we can write the mass as rho times V. Okay, so that's what we'll do. So for F top, we have the pressure at the top times area. For F bottom, we have the pressure at the bottom times the area. And that's equal to M, which is uh, rho times V, multiplied by G with a negative sign out front. Okay? So the next thing we'll do is notice that the volume of this fluid element V that we're referring to over here is just the area times the thickness. In other words, the volume is A times dy. So we'll go ahead and make that substitution. On the left side, at, on the left side we have P top minus P bottom times A. On the right side, we have rho times the volume, which Again, now we're replacing with A times dy, and then that multiplies G. So notice how we can cancel out the area like so. Now, P top minus P bottom is a difference in pressure between the top of the fluid element and the bottom. So since that's a little tiny infinitesimal change in pressure, we can call that dP, okay? And we've canceled out the A, so the only thing left on the other side of the equation is minus rho times G times dy. So the negative sign is telling us that as we go up, as we increase in Y, the pressure decreases. So if you increase the height, the pressure goes down. If you decrease the height, if you go deeper in the fluid, then the pressure goes up. That's the idea. So we can finish this off by just uh, dividing out dy. So now we have dp dy is equal to minus rho times g. So this is a result that we're gonna use to tell us how pressure changes within a static fluid. So next, I wanna show you how you can take the result that we just derived, dp dy equals minus rho times g, and take it a step further. So first of all, let's take dy and multiply through on both sides. So we have dp is equal to minus rho times g times dy. So the next thing we're going to do is integrate both sides of the equation. 
So I'm gonna have the integral of dp on this side. And then on the other side, I'm gonna have the integral of rho times g times dy. So here's the thing, g is constant, that's a given, but rho is constant as long as the fluid is incompressible. Okay, so as long as our fluid is incompressible, we can treat the density as if it's a constant. So this would be a perfectly valid assumption if we're talking about a liquid, like water. Okay, if we're talking about something like air, then that wouldn't be a valid assumption, okay? But anyways, assuming we have an incompressible fluid, both of these are just constants and they can be pulled out of the integral. So on the left side, we have the integral from, let's call it P1 to P2, so just two different pressures, dP. And then we pull out the constants, so minus rho times g. And all we're left with in the integral is dy. So we'll integrate that between two values of y. Let's call them y1 and y2. So these are just two different heights within the fluid. So dp, that integrates just to p, which we evaluate from p1 to p2. And then we have minus rho times g. dy integrates to just y which we evaluate from y1 to y2. So evaluating at the limits on the left side, I have p2 minus p1. On the right side, I have minus rho times g, y2 minus y1. So here's how you can use this. If I know the pressure p1 corresponding to some height in the fluid y1, then I can calculate the pressure p2 at height y2 using this equation, okay? So I can basically calculate what the pressure will be at a given height using this equation. So a special case of this is, let's say we have a container of fluid like this. Let's call this our y-axis. And let's call the top surface of the fluid our height y1, okay? And then y2 will just be some point below the surface. Now the distance below the surface, we'll call that d. Okay? So we can set the zero point of our y-axis wherever we like. So maybe we can set it right there at the top surface of the fluid. So y1 will be zero. And that means y2 is going to be negative d. Okay? So if we apply that in our equation, uh, we have P2 minus P1 equals minus rho times G, Y2 is minus D, Y1 is zero. And so we have P2 minus P1 equals just rho G D. But here's the thing, P1 is just the pressure at the top surface of the fluid. So let's call that P surface, okay? So P2 minus the pressure at the top surface of the fluid, that's what is equal to rho GD, or P2 is equal to the pressure at the surface plus rho GD. So this is saying, if I know the pressure at the top surface of the fluid, and you tell me how far down into the fluid I need to go D, then I can tell you what the pressure is there. And this is saying the deeper we go into the fluid, the more the pressure will increase. So this is how we describe the pressure variation or how pressure changes in a static and incompressible fluid, okay? Because the density in a static incompressible fluid is uniform, it stays the same, we were able to write the pressure difference between two points in this way. So I just showed you the derivation. P2 minus P1 is equal to minus rho times G, Y2 minus Y1. And we can write this in a more intuitive way just by saying the pressure at some depth below the surface is equal to the pressure at the surface plus rho GD.
So the deeper we go, the bigger D is into the, the fluid, the more the pressure will increase. Okay, so that's just a summary of everything we just derived for an incompressible fluid. Okay, so let's actually use that result to do an example. So the Mariana Trench is the deepest part of the world's oceans that we know about. And it's 11 kilometers below sea level or about 37,000 feet below sea level. So the question for you is, what is the pressure at the bottom of the Mariana Trench in units of atmospheres. So we're gonna to need to know a few things to do the calculation. First, one atmosphere is equivalent to 1.013, 10 to the five newtons per meter squared or pascals. And the density of water is 1.00 times 10 to the three kilograms per cubic meter. So based on that, use this relationship between pressure and depth that we just derived to try to calculate the pressure at the bottom of the Marianas Trench. So pause the video, see if you can get this, and then we'll go through it together. Okay, so we're gonna use the result, P is equal to pressure at the surface plus rho G D. So the idea is, here is the top surface of the water, and we're gonna go down into the fluid, a depth equal to 11 kilometers. Okay, now what can we say about the pressure at the surface? Because we need to know that in order to get the pressure way down here. So the pressure at the surface is just one atmosphere because the air just above the water here is at one atmosphere of pressure. So one atmosphere is the same as 1.013 10 to the five pascals, which is a Newton per square meter. So when we do our calculation, the pressure at the surface is 1.013, 10 to the five pascals. And then we're gonna to add to that rho times G times D. Rho is the density, 1.00, 10 to the three kilograms per cubic meter. G is 9.8 meters per second squared. And then D is the depth, which is 11 kilometers or 11 times 10 to the three meters. That's a kilometer, 10 to the three meters. Okay, so if you calculate this, you're gonna get 1.079 times 10 to the eight. Technically, we'd wanna keep two sig figs on that. And the units here are pascals. So real quick, let me show you why the units, in fact, work out that way. So in the second term, we have kilograms per cubic meter, multiplying meters per second squared, multiplying meters, right? Well, to consolidate that, I basically have meters squared on top and meters cubed on the bottom. So it's the same as saying kilograms over meters second squared. But what I can do is multiply by one factor of meters on the top and bottom. Okay, so now I have kilograms times meters per second squared. And I also have meters squared on the bottom next to that. So this quantity right here is a newton. A kilogram, per, uh, a kilogram times a meter per second squared is a newton. So this is Newtons per square meter, which is a Pascal. Okay, so just verifying that this works out in Pascals. But again, the rule of thumb is if you plug in everything with SI units, you'll get out the SI unit of pressure, which is a Pascal. Okay, so next we're just gonna convert this to atmospheres. So you have 1.079, 10 to the eight Pascals, multiplying in every one atmosphere, we have 1.013, 10 to the five Pascals. That's our conversion. So this works out to 1,065 atmospheres, but if we round that off to two sig figs, it's about 1,100, okay? 
That's an absolutely gigantic amount of pressure, okay? Over a thousand times as much pressure that you would experience at sea level is what you'd find at the bottom of the Marianas Trench, okay? Okay, so now that we know a little bit about how pressure changes with depth in a fluid, I wanna tell you about Pascal's barrel. And this is a famous experiment that was allegedly performed by Blaise Pascal in uh, 1646. I say allegedly because the historical record is a little bit spotty and it's not clear if he actually did the experiment or if he just wrote about it and sort of thought about what the consequences might be. Either way, it's an interesting idea and it's helpful to think about. So Blaise Pascal was a French mathematician and physicist who lived in the uh, early to mid 1600s. And a lot of things that we're gonna come across uh, dealing with fluids are named after him because he did a lot of important work to help us understand how fluids work and how pressure uh, changes within a fluid. So here's the experiment. We're gonna have a very long and narrow tube that's fed into a wine barrel, okay? So the barrel is already filled with fluid, but what we're gonna do is gradually fill the tube up with fluid as well. So as we add water to the tube, we're increasing the pressure inside of the barrel because pressure just depends on depth. So how far below the surface of the water here do we have to go to get to the barrel? That depth is what uh, dictates the pressure. So the more water we add to this tube, the more we increase the pressure in the barrel. Now here's the surprising thing. We can make the tube as narrow as you want. So there might not even be that much water there in the tube if it's very, very narrow. But regardless of that, even if there's very little water in the tube, the barrel is gonna burst if the height of that water is large enough. Okay, so all that matters is the height, not the actual amount of water in the tube. And it can be enough to make the barrel explode if the height is big enough. So let's do an example calculation dealing with this sort of experiment. So according to the story, Pascal's barrel burst when the tube was filled to a height of 12 meters with water. So 12 meters is the height of that column of water. So the question is, when the barrel burst, what was the total force exerted on the lid by the water below it and the air above it? Assume that the air is at atmospheric pressure. The density of water is one gram per cubic centimeter, and we'll take the radius of the lid of the barrel to be 21 centimeters, okay? So based on all this, we're gonna get the total force on the lid of the barrel from the water below and the air above the lid. So let's work it out. Okay, so let's draw the lid of the barrel. So above the lid, we have air. And then below the lid, um, we have water. Okay. So the air above the lid is going to be pushing down on it. And we'll call that force F above that it's pushing down with. And the water below the lid is going to be pushing up on it. And we'll call that force F below. So what we're trying to find is the total force. And since these two are going in opposite directions, we'll subtract them. That would be F below minus F above. So overall, there's an upward push on the lid. Okay, so remember pressure is force per unit area, which means force is pressure times area. So this total force can also be thought of as pressure below times area minus pressure above times area, or pressure below minus pressure above times A. Okay, well, the air above the lid is just at atmospheric pressure. Okay, so what we'll say is P 
above is atmospheric pressure, PATM. Now, we can also find the pressure of the water below the lid. by remembering that it only depends on depth. So here's the tube that's going um, into the barrel, okay? And this is the very top surface of the water. Well, it's exposed to air, so at that top surface we expect atmospheric pressure, okay? So in general, we have pressure is equal to pressure at the surface plus rho GD. Well, in this case, we're going a depth of 12 meters down into the fluid to get just below the, the lid of the barrel. So this means the pressure below the lid of the barrel is equal to the pressure at the surface, which is atmospheric, plus rho GD, okay? Okay, so next, let's put those results into our formula for F total. We have, again, P below minus P above times A. P below is P atmospheric plus rho GD. P above, which we're subtracting, is just P atmospheric. And then we're multiplying by A. So. What we have here is just rho times g times d times a. Now the area of this lid, it's a circular area, so that would just be pi times r squared. Okay, so we can write this as rho times g times d times pi r squared. Okay, so now we're ready to calculate. Rho is the density of water, which is 1.0010 to the 3 kilograms per cubic meter. G is 9.8 meters per second squared. D is 12 meters in this case. And then we have pi. R is the radius of the lid of the barrel, which is 21 centimeters or 0.21 meters, and we're squaring that. Okay, so what this comes out to is 1.629 times 10 to the 4. Just going to keep two sig figs on this one. And let's think about our units. So I have meters cubed, if I consider all of the uh, factors of meters in these two terms. But then I have meters cubed on the bottom right here. So that will all cancel. So what's left after that is just kilograms times meters per second squared, which is a Newton. So this comes out as 1.6, 10 to the 4 Newtons, okay? So the barrel, the lid of the barrel, is going to be feeling an upward force of 1.6 times 10 to the 4 Newtons. So you need something to hold the barrel in place that can provide at least this much force or else the lid is just going to fly off. So using what we've learned up to this point, we can actually understand how we can measure air pressure using something called a barometer. So a barometer is just a device that measures the local air pressure using a column of mercury whose height can change. So essentially, we're looking at how this column of mercury goes up and down to tell us something about how the pressure is going up and down. So here's the basic design. Right on top of that column of mercury, we have a vacuum. So all of the air is sucked out of here to create a vacuum. Ideally, it would be a perfect vacuum with absolutely nothing in it. Now, if we go down in the column, this part of the mercury is just exposed to the air. So the air is pushing down on the mercury over here. So let's think about how we can apply this. Remember, we have this pressure depth relationship, which tells us P2 minus P1 is equal to minus rho times G times Y2 minus Y1. Okay, so 
if we set up a coordinate system where this is our y-axis going up like this, and down here is y equals zero, let's call this y1, and let's call this y2. Well, at this height, y2, we just have a vacuum. So that means the pressure, the absolute pressure, is actually going to zero, okay? So what we have is the pressure at height two, P2, is equal to zero. We'll assume it's a vacuum. And the pressure down here is just the pressure of the air because the mercury down here is exposed to that air. And then Y2 minus Y1 that you see in the parentheses here, let's just call that H. That will be the height of the column of mercury in our tube. Okay, so if we make all of those substitutions, here's what we get. I subbed in zero for P2, and then I subbed in H for Y2 minus Y1, and then after that, we can just get rid of these two negative signs, and what we're left with is the pressure of the air is just equal to rho times G times H. In other words, the height of that column of mercury, H, is just directly proportional to the air pressure. So in other words, if the height of that column of mercury goes up, that's telling you that the air pressure has gone up. If the height of that column of mercury goes down, it's telling you that the pressure of the air has also gone down. So we can use that just to measure the pressure. Okay, so here's a question for us to think about. Why do we typically use mercury in a barometer instead of water? Because if you think about it, water is very cheap in comparison to mercury, and it's also much safer. It's not a health hazard if a barometer breaks and water leaks out, right? So to answer this question, we're gonna do a calculation. We're gonna calculate the column height of a barometer filled with mercury and a barometer filled with water when it's exposed to atmospheric pressure. We'll remember that the density of mercury is 13.6 times 10 to the three kilograms per cubic meter. And the density of water is one times 10 to the three uh, kilograms per cubic meter. And the conversion between atmospheres and pascals is also given here. Okay, so let's make these calculations. Let's work it out. Okay, so remember in a barometer, the pressure that we're measuring is equal to rho times G times H which means H, the height of the column of our fluid, is equal to the pressure divided by rho times G. Okay, so let's say we're using a column of mercury, which the chemical symbol is HG. The height of that column, if we're using mercury, would be the pressure of the air divided by the density of mercury times G. So let's make the calculation. If we're saying the air is at atmospheric pressure, it's one atmosphere or 1.013, 10 to the five pascals, which is equivalent to a Newton per square meter. So now the density is 13.6, 10 to the three kilograms per cubic meter. And then G is 9.8 meters per second squared. Now this comes out in meters, and the result is 0.758 meters. So if we're using a column of mercury to measure atmospheric pressure, it's only gonna be about 2.5 feet high. So that's pretty manageable, right? You can, you can build something that's 2.5 feet high. On the other hand, if we use water, H2O, then the height of the column would be given by the pressure of the air divided by the density of, now we're gonna use water, because that's the fluid that we're using, times G. So that would be one, that would be uh, 1.013, 10 to the five Newtons per square meter divided by, now the density is only one times 10 to the three kilograms per cubic meter times G, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, so if you do this calculation, here's what you get, 10.3 meters. 
That's about 34 feet high. So that's not really feasible in most cases. You don't want to build a barometer that's like three stories high. Okay, that's why you use merc. That's why we use mercury because the uh, actual column height is much more manageable. Okay. Okay. So we can also take what we've learned to figure out how pressure changes with height in Earth's atmosphere. So the thing about Earth's atmosphere is that it's made out of air, which is a gas. So it's not an incompressible fluid. We can't use that same result for how pressure changes with depth that we've been using for incompressible fluids. We have to do something else. So the density of Earth's atmosphere, rather than being just a constant like you would have for water or any other type of liquid, is actually gonna be variable and it will decrease with height. So as you go up in the atmosphere, it gets less and less dense. And so the atmosphere basically gradually goes away as you go up in height. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take the equation uh, that we derived at the very beginning of this section, dp dy is equal to minus rho times g. This relates the pressure p and the height y within a static fluid. And then we're also gonna use something called the ideal gas law. If you've taken chemistry, you may have seen this before. If you haven't seen this before, don't worry. Uh, here's how it goes. It's an equation that says P times V is equal to N times K times T. So P is the pressure of a gas. V is the volume of that gas. N is the number of molecules. And then T is the temperature. And then K is just a constant, okay? So it relates the pressure, the volume, the temperature, and the number of molecules within some quantity of gas. So using these two equations, here's what we're gonna derive. We're gonna show that air pressure decreases exponentially with height. So the pressure in Earth's atmosphere is a function of H, that's the height, is equal to P0, that's the pressure at sea level, times E to the minus H over HS. So it's an exponential decay. Okay, that's what we're gonna show. Okay, so we're gonna start with the ideal gas law, which says PV equals N times K times T. So let's rearrange this. Let's divide on both sides by V and then let's also divide on both sides by kt. So we'll have n divided by v is equal to p divided by kt, all right? And by the way, n divided by v is the number of molecules per unit volume, okay? So that's kind of like the density, but not quite, right? It's a number of particles per unit volume as opposed to a mass per unit volume. So if we want the density, which is the mass per unit volume, well, we can do it like this. If each particle, if each molecule of gas has mass m, so we'll say mass or M is the mass of each molecule. And then we multiply by N, which is how many molecules we have. That would just be the total mass of all of those molecules. And then if we divide that by V, well, then that would be the density, right? So in other words, if I take the mass of each molecule and multiply by P over KT using the previous result, that's the density of the air, okay? That's an expression for the density of the air. So how can we use that? Well, remember dp dy is equal to minus rho times g, which means dp, a tiny change in pressure, is equal to minus rho times g times dy. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna plug in for rho, what we found over here. Okay, so I'm gonna have um, minus rho 
which is m times p over kt times g times dy. In other words, dp is equal to minus m times g over kt times p times dy. And all of this stuff here, mg over kt, let's just consider that to be a big constant. So we'll define a new constant. And we'll call it hs, OK? So the way I'm going to define hs is hs is equal to kt over mg. OK, so we have something that's a little bit simpler. Um, I can write this as dp is equal to 1 over hs, with, of course, the negative sign out front, times p times dy. So to rearrange that one a little bit, let's divide on both sides by p. So I have dp over p is equal to minus 1 over hs times dy. So at this point, you should be thinking we can integrate both sides of the equation because on both sides of the equation, I have little infinitesimal quantities of dp and dy. So when we go ahead and integrate both sides, here's what we get. So I have the integral of dp over p equaling, let's just pull the constant out right away, 1 over hs, minus 1 over hs, integral dy. Now, let's put the limits on here. For y, we're talking about a height. So how about I start at height 0, which corresponds to sea level, and then go to some other height, h. Okay. Now, on the other side, we're integrating over pressure. So my bottom limit would be the pressure at height 0. And my top limit would be the pressure at height h. So the limits kind of match on either side of the equation. OK, so on the left side, I am just integrating 1 over p, which is the natural log of p, which I then evaluate from p0 to ph. On the other side, I have minus 1 over hs. dy just integrates to y. And I evaluate that from 0 to h. So here's what we get. I'll have the natural log of pH minus the natural log of P0 when I evaluate the limits on the left side of the equation. That equals minus 1 over HS times H minus 0 when I evaluate at the limits on the right side. OK. So on the left side, I have two natural logs that I'm subtracting. So I can actually bring them together in the same natural log in the following way. I have the natural log of pH over P0. And on the other side, I just have minus H over HS. So here's what I can do with this. I can exponentiate both sides. So if I take e to the power of what's on both sides, I actually undo the natural log. I get rid of it. So I have pH over P0, no more natural log, is equal to E to the minus H over HS. So therefore, pH, the pressure at some height H, is just the pressure at height 0, that's the pressure at sea level, times E to the minus H over HS. This is telling us exactly what I said earlier, that the pressure of Earth's atmosphere is exponentially decaying um, with height. So again, this is the pressure at sea level right here. OK, so let's do one more thing with this. Let's calculate HS. This is what we call the scale height of the atmosphere. And if we go back to what I said earlier, that's kT over mg. OK, kt over mg. 
Okay, so K is something called Boltzmann's constant. The value of this is 1.38, 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. That's just the unit, okay? T is a temperature, which I'm going to measure in Kelvin, uh, 200... And 73 Kelvin is sort of the average temperature of Earth's atmosphere. Now, we're going to divide out M, which is the average mass of a molecule of air. So air is made out of different stuff. You know, you have nitrogen, oxygen, and water vapor, all kinds of stuff. But the average mass turns out to be 4.8, 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. And then G is just 9.8 meters per second squared, okay? So those are just some numbers that we can put into this calculation. And if you do it, you get about 8,000. 8,000 meters is the unit this turns out to be, or about eight kilometers. So Earth's atmosphere has a scale height of about eight kilometers. So here's a summary of what we just derived. The pressure as a function of height in Earth's atmosphere is equal to P0, the pressure at sea level, times E to the minus H over HS. So HS is a constant which we call the scale height of the atmosphere. And we can think of this as the height where the air pressure falls to 1 over E of its value at sea level. Because if you think about it, let's say I plug in HS for the height. So I'll have minus HS over HS in the exponent or minus one. So I'll have E to the minus one out here. That's the same as one over E. In other words, when the height is the scale height, the pressure is one over E times P zero. So again, this is the height where the pressure falls to one over E of its value at sea level. And it turns out for the earth, this happens to be about eight kilometers. And one over E is 0.37, so we can also think of this as 37% of its value at sea level. So when we plot this function out, again, it's an exponential decay. So if we have the pressure of the air on this axis and the height above sea level on this axis, we'll start at P0, we'll start at the maximum value and then just decay away from there. When I hit the scale height, when I'm at height HS, we see again that the pressure is 0.37 times P0. That's 1 over E times P0. And then it just keeps falling exponentially from there. So that's how this works. So with that in mind, um, let's do an example problem. At what height is the air pressure uh, half of its value at sea level? So at what height do we have to go up into the atmosphere so that the pressure is half of its value at sea level. So to do this, you're going to need to know that HS is about 8 kilometers, and also this formula we derived for pressure as a function of height. So pause the video, try to work this out, and then come back to it when you think you have your answer. Okay, so let's work this one out. We have pressure as a function of height is equal to P0, E to the minus H, over HS. So here what we're saying is the pressure is going to be one half of P0, one half of its value at sea level. So we'll have one half P0 equals P0 E to the minus H over HS. So we can cancel out P0 like this. Next, let's take the natural log of both sides. So I have natural log of a half here, and then I have natural log of E to the minus h over hs. So the reason I'm doing this is that the natural log will undo the exponent. So this becomes natural log of a half equals minus h over hs. And h is what we're looking for. So h is equal to minus hs times the natural log of 1 half. So now we can just kind of plug and chug because HS is eight kilometers. So minus eight kilometers times natural log of a half. Punch that into your calculator and you'll see it works out to about 5.5 kilometers. 
So that's the height you'd have to get to in Earth's atmosphere in order for the pressure to be cut in half uh, compared to its value at sea level, okay? So that's going to be it for this video. We'll continue on uh, talking about fluids in the next one. So until then, be safe, be healthy out there. See you later.